Hey everybody, welcome to Sama Seattle Circuit Music and Art. I'm Derek Mazzoni and I am hosting. Um, we are now um, doing multiple live streams, which is awesome. We of course are going through a whole bunch of interesting stuff on the planet, um, dealing with, of course, a pandemic. We're dealing with uh, an, uh, a social transformation, which hopefully will truly, truly uh, create an amazing opportunities for our fellow travelers on this planet that have not had these opportunities before. But one of the most important parts for us here at Sama is to make sure that uh, through this process, the power of music, the power of art to transcend, to create a space for people's hearts to be raised and for connections to be made um, is present and is shared and is amplified. Now, there are many parts to create uh, a beautiful musical experience. You, of course, have the artist, the instruments, the and the, uh, um, the engineering tied to that. But one of the most important parts is the producer, somebody uh, with a vision and with the skill set to put all these parts together. And tonight, on a, a new look for Sama, Seattle Circuit Music and Art, we're going to go a little deeper into that process um, where it's more of an educational perspective there will be performances of course um, but this one is um, a conversation with a producer who I consider a good friend and somebody whose work I deeply deeply appreciate his name is Ian Brennan and he's been involved and in, uh, in championing uh, voices of uh, of artists and people that have don't have an opportunity to be heard as much as they should and also doing the diligent hard work into um, and to uh, making sure that parts of the world that um, are easily brushed aside uh, either by their difficulty, such as the Zomba prison project in Malawi, or populations that are truly on the fringes and at risk, such as um, albino populations in Tanzania. He has uh, gone into these places and he's, and he's um, brought his microphone and his skill set, and therefore the work and the artistry of those populations is seen and heard. Ian Brennan here on Sama. Hello, hey. Ian. Hey. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's good to and see now, you. You, um, um, you've been um, producing for a long time, um, and um, your uh, the stories must must cover the gamut of the experiences uh, that you've had and championing these artists now your your background you know started uh, like most uh, people in rock and uh, and putting that out but it you know you're, you it pivoted most, into most white people most white people <laughs> uh, i'll let you say that um but it, it pivoted and it, it went into some really interesting directions so i would love to know a little bit like what got you into music and music production and then uh secondly where, when did you decide that you didn't want to focus on, uh, on, on white Western artists and go deeper and actually go really deep, you know, into the mountains, into the villages where you could have just stayed in the big cities uh, where it was easier? Please tell us that story. Well, um, you know, like a lot of people, I caught the music bug early, uh, which is basically one of my earliest memories is, uh, is music and dancing and uh i started playing music when i was a child uh the drums and then the guitar when i was five and six and um and i was obsessed uh because i unfortunately heard the jazz quote that is attributed to a lot of different people which is if you don't make it by the time you're 18 you'll never make it so i became uh probably oc about uh mastering the guitar meaning the lead guitar uh and uh and i would do nothing but you know i would skip school to do it i would uh you know uh, not sleep to do it uh you know we're talking about eight twelve hours a day uh for my teen years and um and then i started making records when i was 20 and uh you know was my own worst enemy like most artists uh because of uh lack of objectivity and and ego in whatever form and um and along the way i just uh you know i never cared about authorship and i never cared about fame particularly i just wanted to be part of a creative process and to contribute and i became more and more interested in other people's voices 
and um, the uh, the repetition that is found in the copy cutter industry of recording, especially corporate recording, but really all recording by nature is a big copying machine. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, it caused me to want to see things that were were more unusual. And and you know we have over a hundred thousand releases, full length releases, just in America alone every year now. And it's ever increasing with digital because it's so much easy, more easy to release than it used to be. Yeah. And uh, I felt like, uh, you know, there has to be more than this repetition of straight white males playing standardly tuned guitars, bass and drums, uh, often the same three or four chords, often the same uh, diatonic melodies. Um, and uh, and there is. And, and and so, I mean, that, that process began in the late 80s, almost at the outset of making records and, and just my, my interest in that deepened. But um, I, you know, and I started recording uh, and producing for friends in San Francisco and then um, eventually worked with Ramblin' Jack Elliott and other folk artists like Peter Case. And, um, and then, uh, you know, we started working with Tanara One. We were recorded the record in Algeria, but but the reality is, is I probably never would have stepped foot in. Uh, I mean, I'm a California suburban working class person, and I probably never would have stepped foot um, much overseas, let alone, uh, uh, you know, in Africa and in Asia, if it weren't for my wife, Marlena Umahozadeli, who does all the photos and video for, for everything we do. And she's Italian Rwandan. And, and so our first trip was to uh, go with her mother for her first, her mother's first visit to Rwanda uh, since the early 80s. So since long before the biggest genocide in 94. And uh, she was reuniting with a friend who she'd been told had perished in 94, but then found out in 2008 had not. Um, And so we we went back to reunite with her friend in 2009. And we went in search of music. Marlena was making a documentary about her mother's return. And we we sought out music and, and, uh, you know, after two weeks of searching, we hadn't found anything really that, that we felt particularly compelling. There was a lot of good stuff. There always is. But, um, but you know, again, was it enough? Was it unique enough to justify being released? I mean, that's always my concern. And uh, we were lucky enough to meet the good ones. And, um, and then we just have kind of kept going from there. And we've, we've produced 28 albums and counting uh, by international artists from non-English language countries, usually underrepresented populations globally in terms of media. And, uh, and, and sometimes, as you mentioned, persecuted populations like the, yeah. the, the Tanzania Albinism Collective. Yeah, and, it's, um, and the thing that really struck me in looking at your work is that it moves, it really moves. It moves a part of your, um, your soul and your heart that, um, to your point, the cookie cutter stuff, the things that it's just like, okay, you know, I'm a fan of pop music. I'm not, it's not, this isn't so like, I. you know, um, but it just, it just feels that there's so much expression, so many languages, so many ways to really live like a human being on, on, on this uh, sphere that these artists need a place to be heard. So let's, let's actually share that because we have, we have um, uh, footage that your wife shot of uh, the good ones in Rwanda. So let's look at this and let's speak about them a little bit because it's so compelling to me. Very good. Yes, let's see it. Beautiful. Nava nava rabura ra, babura rukore rifaranga, ikari ganu wisize. I'm 
It's beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. Amazing. They're they're just they're stirring. They're just they're they're um I don't even know the word. there's just their their ability to share. Um, we don't speak the language, but uh, we we get. I personally uh, get understand it a little bit. Uh, I love to see the lushness of Rwanda in that too. And you guys have been working together for eleven years, so there's like a connection on on many levels. There is. I mean, uh, you know, there's uh, almost a familial connection, meaning to the country because of Marlena's heritage. But beyond that, um, you know, th as you can see, these are like like many, I think, of the finest artists. There's there's something extra. Uh, with these individuals, and I don't mean better. Uh, every every life is is it has great value, but but there there's an extra sensitivity, um, and and so uh, and the ease with which they communicate, um, the lack of affectation is inspiring. Um, and uh, we were there uh, in December with them, and uh, they we went to Adrian's house that was filmed there in the in the hills uh which are very remote um cars don't usually go there it's quite hard to get there by car and uh we recorded with them some more just we, we were there really just to say hi to them because we we were there with marlena's mother again and we'd done a recording trip nearby in, in a in a fairly close by country and uh we recorded you know, just to do it while we were there, and they sat down together, John Vier and and Adrian, and 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 recorded six songs that John Vier had never heard before, and uh, and they would talk about it for about a minute. Adrian would play him a little bit, and then they'd play the song, 
and it was perfect wow. every time. They never stopped. They never said, "Oh, now I got to do that again. I could have <laughs> done that line better." Just you know, That's just beautiful. Uh, just incredible. Like like really, they've been singing together since they were little kids. So they're really one voice, and um, and and they really, I think, singing together is such a powerful thing because it's corrective. You know, so you don't need auto tune. You need to sing together. And, and, you know, when you get 30 people singing together, they can have seemingly the worst voices in the world and they won't be out of tune collectively. Mm -hmm. And these two guys, when they sing together, they correct each other in that they, they almost have learned to sing like as one voice only. So sometimes when they sing alone, they're a little bit flat or a little bit sharp, but then together they're, they're just one and, and, and sound it on, and it works. Yeah. I mean, yeah. cause you, you really, they dovetail so much in such close harmony, which is, you know, a rural thing, I guess, because in America, there's a lot of close har harmonies in the Appalachian and, you know, I mean, from various sources. And and so when they, they're singing, they're trading off lead lead and harmony vocal um, so that it's, it's very hard to tell really who's singing what, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like there's really no lead sometimes. It's beautiful. And, um, well, of course, post the link to their band camp and make sure that, you know, in this time that bands can tour that um, as many of our viewers um, get to learn more about them because the complexity of their work and uh, in its simplicity is just stirring. So the um, the good ones are from Rwanda, but you also just recently worked with um, a band out of northern Ghana, um, Frafra. Tell us about that a little bit. Well, Frafra uh, are in northern Ghana, which is, um, you know, like most countries, uh, the the rural areas, the more remote areas are a world away from the capital, uh, where you know, which a lot of people may see. So um, uh, more than uh, other places, understandably so. I mean, you know, the capital's got a big airport and, and is more developed. And they're up there in the north, the mostly Muslim north, and, and funerals are are a big deal there like like a lot of places but meaning that they um they can go on for days and reportedly sometimes up to a week uh the celebration is is quite an important aspect of of uh the process and uh so small who's the leader of fra fra uh has been performing you know funeral songs uh, in, in the north for decades and he looks to me and certainly acts like somebody who's a generation or two younger than he is. I was quite shocked to learn that he was uh, 72 years old. I mean, I never wow. would have guessed it in a second. Because... I'll have what he's having. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He dances. Uh, he dances. You know, he's limber and in it, but also just vocally, he's he's a true, a true virtuoso and a ch true paradox in the sense that he's got a very very big voice. You know. Uh, I'm powerhouse and uh and so they they do funeral songs but I, I think the beautiful thing is that they're bringing a lot of joy to the process they're bringing a lot of complexity you know um but primarily um a lot of joy which is you know in in pretty sharp contrast I think to what often happens in in uh you know the west so to speak um I, I lost my own father last month and uh to have, you know, done this record and had this record released just a few weeks prior to my father's death, was was helpful to me, you know, because it, I, I'd experienced it with them when we recorded it at the very very end of 2018, and and in the ongoing relationship with them, but uh, but to have the record kind of enter the world during this this period where there's so much suffering and death, mm -hmm. and then and then my own father, and to see an approach to it that I think was more nuanced and and probably more realistic ultimately and more balanced is has been of great benefit uh to me personally the the um sacred experience you know uh, birth um families coming together marriages or gatherings however you choose to do that and then passing um uh, is is a place where um i've discovered a lot of really powerful music and artists created and so when i saw this initially from glitter beat the, the label and then you told me about it i was really intrigued but let's take a look um at some footage of fra fra from northern ghana great <laughs> 
Beautiful. Thank you. Fra Fra from Northern Ghana. How did you find them? How did you guys find each other? Well, I mean, every every uh, project has been different. Uh, it's it's just a leap of faith. Uh, we do these as labors of love. We lose money on 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 them, and uh, the, we never know if if we'll find anything. Um, in most cases, uh, and and uh, and then when we record, we're we're interested in the process, not the product. Um, so we have not released probably. Not as many, but almost as many records as we've released, because if to, to do otherwise would be hypocritical if we just had made a decision that, oh, since we went to, to Region X and, and, and we wanted to find music, then therefore we're going to release it no matter what. It's, it, it, no, we, we make sure that a release is justified. And, and usually in the process, you know it. There's a moment. Um, sometimes it's right away. Uh, when it's somebody who ver very virtuosic like small um, in other cases particularly with amateur musicians meaning people that have not done music before uh, when they're composing for the first time or singing solo publicly for the first time there's a moment where just a song comes from somewhere that no one expected including the person usually themselves and it's just so beautiful that it's like okay well this is this is what we're here for. This is the dream, really, um, is is to participate in in that process. And so we were actually in Northern Ghana for another release, which we didn't have any guarantee, but and and it is going to uh, come out early next year. Um, and while we were there, we you know trying to keep our ears and eyes open, and and uh, we we saw and heard a lot of music, and a lot of it's good. Um, a lot of it, some people would like more, maybe most people would like more, uh, meaning it might be slicker or, or this or that. But eventually we, we, uh, we caught wind of, of, uh, of small and, 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 uh, what he was doing with, with Fra Fra music and Fra Fra culture in the Fra Fra language. Uh, and, uh, we, uh, and we met with him and, and. It, his was a case where it was like, okay, this is this is going to be something um, beautiful and something of great value and something that uh, you know deserves as big a platform as as can be found. I mean, sure. you know, I mean, my mind is probably a little twisted or my ears are a little bent, but uh, you know, if anybody deserves a big platform of millions of people or hundreds of thousands or billions which i don't know that anybody does but if anybody does i think oh yeah i think what he does uh does deserve that so much more than what's shoved into our ears and down our throats and gouged into our eyes daily by the the corporate machinery um <laughs> no, it's true it's true there's there, there's um it, but to me it also speaks to um a visual element because you're hearing it but when you see it when you see um, where they are, who they are, you you see their spirit, and I just I would love to see more of that because often I mean I've been lucky enough to be in, in various places and see these artists in their homes, and it's a different kind of musical experience. You know, they're not like dragged through customs, 
and you know cavity searches eating food that they never had before and it's just like exhausted time zone when you're there and they're giving you their best at that moment it really is a transcendental experience especially when it's this kind of music or the music with the intent with the raw intention of transcendence i find it is like this is stunning and you know that also leads me to um to um Ustad Sami and uh, the record that you produced, God is Not a Terrorist, uh, this amazing uh, singer of, um, of devotional music of Pakistan. You know, often um, when you think of uh, Sufi music of Pakistan, you think of Nusrat Ali Khan or the Sabri brothers, or if you go deeper, uh, Abida Parveen and others. But um, this is one of the times that you and I met because um, uh, I went to Sama uh, with my dear friend John, uh, John, and we went to Walmart there and we got a chance to see him. No, you know, based on the fact that uh, I got the record, I've been playing it, loving it, and then got a chance to see him. And the complexity of what he's able to do, the range of his vocal style. And um, it gave me a different perspective on uh, Pakistan. It gave me a different perspective on the complexity of these people, especially where in the West, you know, Pakistan is tied to terrorism, Osama bin Laden, all of this stuff. Here's this one artist with just the utterance of his voice, brush that aside. And you got a chance to actually experience him, his spiritual belief, but also a window into this beautiful country that doesn't, you, you don't get a chance to see it. You don't get a chance to hear it. It's just one voice. You know, going to your point, we get this one message, one music being crammed onto us. Propaganda is even more pervasive and harder where you try to take, you know, Pakistan is gigantic. It's and huge. It is like, it's so complex and you just get this one message um, of that. And so having Ustad Sami there was really compelling. I want to, I want to play this video first and then I want to talk about Ustad Sami because um, uh, A, I had a chance to meet him with you. So it was beautiful. Yeah. Let's see it. Great. <laughs> Sami, uh, the record is out on Glitterbeat Records, which we love quite a bit, and um, it's called God is Not a Terrorist. I got a chance to see him at his last performance, not last as in like he's passed, but last time he got a chance to be on stage. No, it could be. We never know. Uh, woman held. <laughs> um, thank you for being honest, uh, but let's hopefully, let's let's see what, what can happen. I'm, I'm crossing my fingers. Glass yeah. Full. He's amazing, and um, tell me a little bit about um, 
uh, how he sings, why it is so unique, and also, if you can, uh, a little bit more about Pakistan, because one of the things um, that, you know, in working with Sama and creating this is that uh, music and art is a window to another culture, to another people, and it's a powerful one because it's it's hard to put it into a box. And especially with Nusrat Sami. And before that, like, you know, we had this conversation. Nusrat Fatah Ali Khan, amazing, became so huge. It became like the one artist. It's like the Elvis, John Lennon of Pakistan. It was just everywhere, pervasive. Um, but there's complexity. Like, this isn't Kuali. It's another type of singing. Um, Surti? 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 The, Surti. Surti. And, um, and he sings in, like... Like he, he was able to go through like so many notes. It was like just just it was this this transcendent. Speak to this. You could do it better than I can. No, no you're doing great. Um, he uh, you know his system is a system of recovery, um, and uh, it's embracing complexity and amb ambiguity and nuance, which I think is what we're talking about here. Really, is that a, how can a country of two hundred and 13 million people be represented by one individual. And, it, you know, Pakistan is is an example, and, and Nigeria historically has been another one of uh, kind of the double-edged sword, that they, they've had an artist that has made impact, at least with music lovers uh, throughout the world, so Fela in, in Nigeria and Nazrat Fadi Ali Khan from Pakistan. Uh, but there's, there's a downside to that, which is, Again, how can one voice represent so many people? How is that possible? And so really all of this is about diversity, diversity, diversity. I think the answer uh, anywhere you go is that, number one, there's no small countries. I mean, we, we have two records coming out next year from two of the smallest countries in the world, but they're not small. There are a million people. And I, th I think the best example of diversity is within families. You know, I think most of us, if we have siblings, we oftentimes look at our siblings and we wonder if we're related to them. Um, you know, we love them and we see certain similarities, but then in other ways, we might be night and day in our views politically or artistically. And I think yeah. artists, yeah, they do offer a view, but they, they offer a pretty, you know, strange view and in, in, into to what's going on too. And I think essentialization is always the dangerous thing and diversity is the antidote to that. So the essentialization, and this is how culture gets transmitted and contaminated largely in terms of, of, of the, the truth of it, is that, you know, if someone comes from Romania and they meet uh, 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 Tom Waits and they think that that represents your average American, uh, they would be wrong. Um, yeah. and, 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 and some would argue that he represents a better America and, and that may very well be true. And that's the beauty of art, but th there's a greater complexity there. And so what Ustad is doing vocally is a 49 note microtonal system. Um, as a lot of people might know in our system, we have uh, officially 12 notes. We usually use seven of those 12 notes often with blues and folk in, in, in our culture and most other cultures historically start with five and then it usually grows and expands from there. And he's, he's doing 49 notes. So that means for every one of our notes in our uh, custom scale, I mean our normal major minor scale, he's doing an entire scale. Um, and, and so, uh, and he spent his lifetime mastering this and he's been really un unyielding and committed to his vision. He can do the styles that other people know, like Quali, which is, you know, a celebration music, and his sons are masters of it. He can do this music, but he's chosen instead to do this ancient form that he has to re-envision because nobody knows for sure what it was mm -hmm. and try to recover what he sees as the lost tones, you know, the ones that have been considered wrong and he's trying to take those negatives literally and turn them into positives and, and show that they have value by exploring the the subtlety of human emotion through the nuance of the notes themselves and i think one of the most beautiful things i'm sure you saw it when he performed is that uh, he will sometimes do this sweep from near the bottom of his register all the way up and he'll he'll he conducts a lot with his hands and arms and he'll he do he'll do these sweeps upwards and then he'll go back and he'll do it again and then he'll go back and he'll do it sometimes a third or fourth time 
and every time he does it, he's going through and he's hitting different microtones every time. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's very, very subtle, um, maybe even something that would elude the av average listener, including me, um, maybe elude anybody but him. Uh, but, uh, you know, his hearing is so profound and his concentration is so great. And he was the chosen one in his family, which meant that, uh, you know, a musical family, a lineage that had been passed down for almost a thousand years. And uh, what, what that meant was that his, his teacher, it, it, what, what his teacher did was did not allow him to speak for years. He could only express himself vocally for years. And he didn't perform, meaning be on a stage and perform until he was in his late 30s. That's how long wow. he's, you know. that's some you know. serious, you know. Yep. I, it's going to sound sad, but like, you know, Shaolin Temple stuff, like you are just going to like pick up this pebble with a rub with your fingers and drop it. That's amazing. That kind of dedication and that kind of, um, um, uh, uh, that kind of dedication to mastering something yep. and then be able to share it. Now, we had this conversation also um, that some of the work that he is dealing with is pre-Islamic, which is uh, difficult in, um, you know, in Pakistan right now, that he's actually championing this, which causes rifts within certain populations and to be able to stand firm, like, you know, the 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 music speaks for itself. It will not be just because it doesn't fit a particular current narrative doesn't mean that it will be cut, that it will be the, the, the honesty of that. I found really, really stirring. And, um, and you know, one of the intentions, Sama, of course, uh, before we started live streaming, was to bring artists such as Astami to Seattle and to from there to the United States because it, they need to be seen, they need to be heard. Um, in order to start creating this relationship with uh, art, artists, individuals, and therefore countries and groups that the propaganda machine um, tells you to be wary of. It's bullshit. No. So um, on that note, I wanted to ask you a co I wanted to get a quick question. You have a background, you're an author, and you have a background in mental health. So you've also told me that sometimes you're asked to um, help produce artists um, who um, would be difficult at times. You know, they're amazing, but they can be difficult to work with because of their their art. So, what's your secret there? How do you how do you approach an artist with that kind of reputation? Often, artists do. It takes a particular kind of mindset to go. Here I am. Um, what's your approach with that? Well, I mean, I don't know that I have an approach. It's just uh, you know, out of necessity. I mean, I my my sister has Down syndrome. Um, and so I grew up, uh, you know, always valuing nonverbal communication and, and ways of, of connecting with people. And there was, there was, you know, mental health issues in my family. Um, and so when I turned 18 and I had to support myself somehow, and I'd failed to do that by obsessively playing guitar, um, the only thing that interested me was to work in social service and mental health of some sort and it was very hard to get hired as a long-haired unqualified kid but eventually uh, a hospital hired me um, to work night shifts cleaning up people's diapers uh, for minimum wage and uh, I just had to and continued to work in hospitals for 15 years and and uh most of that time I worked in the psychiatric emergency room for Oakland, uh, California, uh, where I did the triage interviews when people would come in uh, that the police had felt were a danger to themselves and or to others. And uh, somehow, you know, the worlds intersected and, and, uh, and you know, it's, it's certainly not a planned thing. And, and along the way, uh, sometimes people would ask me to work with with you know, people that were knowingly difficult, people with addiction problems or people with uh, uh, mental health issues. And, and uh, you know, knock on wood, I mean, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's every, every situation is different. But in general, I found that, that you know, most people, it's, it's, you just have to listen to them. I mean, it's really just about listening and, and trying to connect. And Zomba Prison was an interesting example because I didn't think a lot about it maximum security prison overcrowded uh in malawi which at the time was the the world's number one poorest nation and has been firmly lodged sadly in the in the top 10 for a long time as long as i think 
I've known. And, um, but we went to the prison there and we recorded and it was after, you know, you know, we recorded the record. We didn't know if there would be a record. We didn't know if the record would come out. It took a long time to find somebody to put it out. Then it finally came out and it, you know, got some attention and that was that. And then a year later it got a Grammy nomination and then suddenly it, it became a, a big story and, you know, a, kind of a, 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 a story of these individuals and what they did achieved. Mm -hmm. But at that point, a lot of people began to ask me like, you know, about the experience. And I, I hadn't thought too much about the experience of going into the prison in that way, because for me, in many ways, it was familiar, you know, I mean, okay, I was in a, a, a country far away, and they were speaking a different language. But uh, I've, I've worked in prisons, I've worked in jails, I've, I've, I've taught a lot in these environments. And, and so, um, I guess, you know, by no design of my own that, that those experiences have, have uh, been beneficial just in terms of uh, being able to to uh, meet people and, and record music that, that might otherwise be be more difficult to uh, to record or, or to, to facilitate, I guess, Got it. you know. Yeah. And they now their voices are heard. Their stories are being shared. And you are a pivotal role in it so thank you um oh thank you please continue um we're going to be putting links to all sorts of information about you but you've got a couple of things coming up so just like share with everybody um what are the two things that you have coming uh well we have uh in in the immediate future there's a there's a record that we did with uh my my sister and her community um her sheltered workshop community that's going to come out in the fall and shortly thereafter will be a record um uh second record from Ustad Sami um which the 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 first record featured some of the longer pieces but this fe features even more meaning uh only three songs you know two of them are 20 minutes almost 20 minutes long each um and uh, so it's more immersive you know the the concert you saw of Ustad in in Australia, one of the two uh, was a single song for 75 minutes. They gave them an extra 15 minutes because they'd seen them do a similar thing in England where they played for an hour and did one song. So they said, we're going to give them 15 minutes more. <laughs> and 75 minutes, you know, a 76-year-old man played for 75 minutes without taking a break. Amazing, amazing. I have some footage of that. So... um uh, we will edit that in. So we we're describing this. We're going to hopefully be able to share that with people. But, um, you know, it's a crazy time. Um, we're not going backwards. We're going to go forwards. And we will find a way to bring Ostad Sami and these other artists to the stages or to the screens of, um, of the world because this music is vital and it needs to be seen and heard. Ian Brennan, thank you for being on Sama, Seattle Circuit Music and Art, and we're going to do this again. Really appreciate well, it. Thank you. Thank, thank you so you. much. Okay. Be well. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Seattle Circuit Music and Art, I'm Derek Mazzoni. Uh, we do this every single week, 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, and, of course, these are available um, on um, Facebook and YouTube, and we'll be, we'll be streaming to other platforms as this new technology and new system of expression is... Uh, we're, we're trying to get a handle on it, and it's been pretty great. It's been great to be able to share this. I want to thank everybody out there. Huge shout out to STG, our co-sponsor and promoter, and um, the production crew and everybody helping put this together. Be well. Take care of yourselves. Wear a mask um, when you're outdoors and indoors with people that you don't know. And, um, and see us next week. Bye.